Hello and welcome to the Slumbery Sloth Book Nook, a podcast about all things books, publishing and more. My name is Emma and today my guest is Catalina Watt. Catalina is a master's publishing student, writer and events assistant at Golden Hair Books. Now on with the show. Hello Catalina. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me onto your show. I'm so excited that, to be here. How are you? Uh, I'm great, actually. <laughs> well, I have been better, but, you know, it's been great. So, mm-hmm. no, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. So, um, so at the moment, you're currently studying an MA in publishing. That is right, aren't you? Yeah, it's actually an MCS, which is kind of unusual for a publishing degree, um, but yes. <laughs> That is different, because normally it's MA, isn't it? Quite a lot Sorry, I said MCS. MSC, there we go. Ah. <laughs> Master of Science. <laughs> awesome, okay. So, obviously, obviously, we'll go into more details about your um, your Master's in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what are your current ventures? What are you doing at the moment? Oh my gosh, Um, I'm one of those sort of um, portfolio career people. So at the moment, obviously I'm doing my master's, but I also work as an events assistant and bookseller at Golden Hair Books, which is a lovely independent bookshop in Edinburgh, um, where I'm currently based. Um, I'm also a book reviewer for Sublime Horror and um, yeah, sitting on a few different panels for various literature um, awards and things like that. So just lots of different projects and yeah, doing some writing of my own on the side as well. So yes, many strings to my bow. (laughs) You're a very busy person like me as they're like trying out different things whilst they're doing their studies. For sure, yeah, I think it's a a good thing to do. (laughs) Yes, I I think it's just balancing, isn't it? Everything. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. (laughs) And then crying in between. (laughs) Okay, so obviously following on to that, Mm -hmm. going on to your current master's degree um how did you find the courses helping you to pursue a career in publishing Mm -hmm. so um the reason I decided to go and do a publishing master's was I had previously worked in publishing um I worked as an audio assistant for Little Brown in London um which is part of Hachette and I really enjoyed that experience um but for me I I didn't want to stay in London and and that was um I think the industry is definitely a lot more regionally diverse than when I was working for Little Brown, which was about four years ago. And so I went off traveling and then I decided, okay, I'm coming back to the UK. I want to get more sort of stuck into my publishing career. And I think a publishing master's was a really excellent way of getting a holistic approach to the industry because in audiobooks, while I loved my role and it was quite multifaceted, um, there were some aspects that I didn't touch on as much because it was mostly production and marketing. So editorial, for example, and rights I didn't have that much interaction with. And so I just sort of thought, I think I know what area I'm interested in, but it's always more helpful to understand the entire process kind of overall. Um, I think that's really useful for everybody. That's very awesome. Because it's quite unusual for people that are already in publishing to go and do an, uh, a master's degree. Would you say that? Yeah, I think um, there's a few people on my course who've done sort of internships and sort of, um, I guess, had a taste of what the industry is like. And I think similar to me, they're trying to find specifically what their specialization is going to be but most people I know who have done masters or on my program for example or other ones I know um, are either coming straight out of an undergraduate degree and are looking to hone particular skills for the publishing industry or they've sort of done an undergraduate degree gone and done various things and decided they want to go into publishing and they see a master's as a particular route into finding the right skill set and the right kind of networks to be able to do that. All oh, right. So would you say with the skills based on your course currently, mm-hmm. would you say it's more like finding where your strengths lie and is it is it quite practical? Are you learning like the overall different sectors and departments? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think perhaps that might be a difference with it being a Master of Science. Is it's very hands-on um, and very practical, which is exactly what I wanted out of it. And so um, kind of in the first term, it was more... Um, I guess theoretical, so a lot to do with like the history of print, the history of the publishing industry, um, what book selling used to be and what it's evolved into, and a lot about kind of um, a lot of data. I'm, I'm really into data now, um, and kind of analysing it from yeah, quite an academic theoretical point of view with a lot of essays and and that kind of approach, but also at the same time learning 
software so obviously kind of the whole adobe suite um with a focus on like indesign and photoshop has been a big thing but yeah we've touched on marketing we've touched on publicity obviously editorial is a big one i think a lot of people when they come into a publishing degree are keen to go into editorial and so they kind of focus on that first of all but we've looked at rights we've done contracts um trying to think if there's anything we haven't done we've we've touched on translation even because there's some people in my course who are interested in that so yeah I think it's definitely given me a an idea a little bit of what the whole process does you know we've talked about agents we've talked about scouts so yeah I think they're quite open to sort of being like what are you interested in and I think some people approach the master's not even knowing some of these roles exist. So that can be great. That's awesome, because you're getting a diverse range of um, uh, things, aren't you? And then you can narrow your focus. Absolutely, and I think um, they're all excellent transferable skills, which I know is such a like buzzword of the corporate world, but it truly is useful to be able to um, to sort of sideways step into various roles and different size companies as well, I think, um, in Scotland in particular, I'm not sure what it's like down... You're in Devon, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what it's like down there, but for us up here, it's very much... There's a, quite a few big publishing houses, but it's nothing quite like London. Uh, but there are a lot of fantastic um, kind of smaller independent publishers. And in those cases, it's often a small team who are doing multifaceted roles. So there's not quite the distinction which there would be in like a huge company where you're doing your very set role in your team which is quite segregated sometimes and as I think it kind of has to be um, on a larger scale so I think knowing how to do lots of different things and wear multiple hats can be really useful if something like an independent publisher is what you're interested in. Yeah of course I mean down this way we we have very small publishers Um, there was recently Mm -hmm. a regional map put on um, I yes. saw it on Twitter that mm-hmm. that publishing blog. I don't know who created it, but it was really good. Yeah. And then you saw like all the where all the indie pubs are based. Definitely. Um, I have to admit, there's like not many down here. Um, mm-hmm. I did work with one like literally probably about a week ago, mm-hmm. but they they're very very small, mm-hmm. um, and it just shows you how many publishers are in certain areas, especially around London. Even though London is well the big five are Mm -hmm. there's loads of indie pubs in there as well it's just a massive like melting pot of publishers and different types of publishers there's new publishers coming up and being made all the time Mm -hmm. so I think there are definitely kind of I don't know needs to be a shift maybe to different areas but I guess it's just one day hopefully I can make my own and then I can do and down here but (laughs) that's the dream um but yeah, it's a good it's dream. Just, <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but yeah, it's kind of nice to know that there's publishers pretty much every, in every quarter of the country. Absolutely. And I think um, it's definitely, I think people are much more aware of it. Um, I think publishing has been, and, and it's not just a, a publishing industry um, discussion. It's it's true of a lot of different industries, I think. But I think, um, I'm like, I'm from London originally. And so I think I have kind of an unusual perspective of someone who grew up in London, worked there and decided they didn't want to live there, um, at least for now. And so I think sometimes with publishing, which is kind of what I can speak for, people feel that they have to move to London to be able to have a viable career. And I'm so... Um, disheartened by that because I think London's a great place but of course it's not the only option and so I think you're right I think these conversations about regional diversity are so important but also not just the conversation actually you know putting your money where your mouth is and um, and sort of like raising the profile of the companies that already exist but then other bigger companies maybe thinking of having regional offices outside of London and you know other companies that are starting up thinking hey we could do this anywhere. It doesn't have to be just this one city. Um, so I'm, I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah, I mean, I, there was a conversation recently with some of the big five and they're looking at maybe putting offices. I don't know, I don't know, like, I only read the article briefly, mm-hmm. but they're looking at maybe l- trying to make regional offices in certain areas of the yeah. country so they can move a lot of the work. But I think the way it's definitely going is that free. you can do definitely do some work remotely not all sure. jobs but you can do some work remotely especially like marketing unless you have to go into the office for yeah some reason but I think 
a lot more companies are now doing work from home, say, three days on, two days off, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. is quite encouraging because there's a lot of people who live in, I know, for example, Exeter, mm-hmm. and there's a two-hour fast train to London, and a lot of people do three days on and then two days off, right. so they can live there and get yeah. to and from, which I think is great. It's a, I think mm. it's great to see that that's going that way. But it's gonna. I don't know how it's gonna adapt to publishing because obviously technology is mm. changing so fast. So for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really interested to see what will happen, and I think um, I'm all for kind of flexible working within all industries, but especially the one you know that we're going into because um, not just kind of with people's locations, but you know with people's time, with people's different needs. Um, you know, some people have different responsibilities that mean that the nine to five work day doesn't necessarily work for them and there's no reason that with all this kind of technological advancement we can't um find something that you know negotiate something that works for people because you know everyone's productive in different ways and I think sometimes imposing a very strict schedule just isn't isn't you're not going to get the best out of your workers and you're not also going to be able to retain and recruit the best people so it's it's definitely got to be a conversation of course of course so going back onto your masters, um, yeah, I've had this debate. I spoke to a couple of people when I was working at London Book Fair. So I'm currently uh-huh. doing English with publishing. So cool. Okay. Um, a lot of people go, "That's quite unusual to have the publishing yeah. minor." That's a very like excellent combination, though. But I've never heard of that before, so that's really fascinating. Yeah, not many unis do it. I know that mm-hmm. a couple of Bath do it. Obviously, Brooks do it, um, and obviously Plymouth do it. Um, mm-hmm. um, but obviously, we're having the talk about is it obviously doing weighing up the pros and cons of um masters in publishing Mm -hmm. so what do you think that the most important thing is to think about when deciding to do a masters in publishing yeah um I think it's such an individual decision but I think that definitely think about why you want to do a not just a master's but this particular master's at this particular university because I think um you know master's programs vary so much even just um for example in Scotland we have two masters two as far as I'm aware so there's R1 at Napier which is um an MSc as I said but then there's also an MLit at Stirling and they're very different from what I understand in terms of course content both excellent courses and we we sort of see a lot of each other because we're the only two in Scotland um (laughs) So, but I think just, I think figuring out what it is that you want out of the experience can be so helpful because, um, it, you know, some of them are different lengths. Mine is just a year and a year goes very quickly. Um, and so I think if you don't have a focus on what you want to get out of it, it can, it feels like some of the opportunities can kind of pass you by. Um, definitely kind of, I would write up, a, I'm a very kind of organised list based person. So a pros and cons list, um, obviously think, you know, there's practical things to consider like money. Um, masters can be very expensive and not everyone's in a kind of financially privileged position to be able to afford that without having to really think about that. And I was one of those people. Um, and also, to be honest, I, I I don't think I would have gone into a master's straight out of an undergraduate degree and some people want that and some people don't but I think um I would always I would always advise people to be a little bit wary of are you considering doing this master's because you're not sure what else to do um which I think can probably just be quite I think that can just be a bit of a a waste of your time sometimes because that's not a very I don't know um I just think you'd get more out of it if you kind of had that distance and that time to reflect before diving into something I feel like more research you can do obviously you don't quite know until you get there but the more research you can do about like your particular courses and what makes them different from each other and what tangible skills in terms of you know practical stuff like what can you have um what you're going to have on your cv what kind of portfolio material you're going to have what will you have after this master's that will make you stand out from people who don't have a master's degree in publishing that's what i would say <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great advice because i think it's just weighing up everything isn't it i think for sure if you take a bit of a step back because a lot of people end up jumping into ma's or master's degrees mm-hmm. when they graduate and i yeah. don't want to fall into that 
trap. Like, I want to take I mean, some time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can understand it. It's. I think graduating is quite scary, and I think, um, obviously, you know, if if we we're in education for so long, and suddenly you're sort of there in the in the world, and it feels a bit difficult. Um, like you, you know, we all have to kind of find focus and guidance, and there are lots of excellent resources out there, and and sort of you know, um, I think higher education can be a totally valid option for people but I do feel like sometimes new graduates feel obliged to do a master's because they're sort of like well I know academia I'll stick to what I know um because it's easier than than trying something different and kind of getting out there into the scary world and I I completely understand that but I think that being motivated by fear is not the best motivation (laughs) Yes, definitely. <laughs> so, taking a bit of a different direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, you're a writer, aren't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's taking a bit of a different direction. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, this is good. Um, so, where does your inspiration come for your writing? Oh my gosh, um, that's a tricky one. So, I I used to write a lot more long form prose when I had more time to be honest or I should say make more time because that's that you know you can always make time to write but I think um I did a lot of writing of novels when I was kind of um doing my undergrad and and when I was a teenager um and recently I've been doing more short fiction um yeah I think I really enjoy writing prompts and I was in a creative writing society during my undergrad and so I kind of got into a good flow of um using prompts and I have these um writing tools which um they're called story cubes and it's this really kind of cute um fun I think it's kind of like a creative game for teachers to use in in classrooms and that kind of thing but I really love it as a writer's tool so they're just die and you um yeah so they're dice and you roll them and they have like pictures on the sides and they're just there to act as writing prompts and you have to just kind of weave together all the images to make a story um So I kind of have a bank of like writing exercises, but to be honest, I kind of just keep a notebook and I I feel like when I'm busy, that's when the ideas come and they sort of just percolate and I write them down and I think about them. And then when I have time to to go back to them, there's kind of this hoard of ideas ready. I just have to sort of look through and try and remember what I meant when I sort of jotted down this random thing. Um, I'm also really lucky to be surrounded by a lot of creative people. And I think you probably experienced this with, with your degree and kind of doing English and publishing together um yeah like at the moment I'm creating a literary anthology and I was so lucky that I just sort of turned around and was like who do I know who's around who has time to write something for this and is willing to and I had so many of my pals um who are amazing writers who I've worked with before just be there and so they're an excellent source of inspiration because we just bounce ideas off each other and they're always there to critique my work and vice versa so yeah I think just kind of immersing yourself in books reading lots and um and always being open you kind of have to be like a sponge that's how I think of it (laughs) yeah of course I think um definitely get the combination between the two when you're doing your studies don't you You get like a mishmash of so many different kind of like creative stuff Um, yeah yeah because we have this anthology we put out every year called ink and Mm. um we've just i I was a social media editor for that one Mm -hmm. and you get to see so many amazing entries you're like we only can pick so many yeah oh it's so hard yeah i um i was recently um as part of the placement i was doing for my course i was working with um, Bloodbath Literary Zine, which is a horror magazine um, based in Edinburgh, and I was one of the editors on that, and we were looking through submissions, and I was just like, oh my gosh, how? How do we do this? And it's, I think it really gives you a lot of perspective on how difficult it is for the the, the people who are having to choose writing and, and, you know, having to accept or reject pieces, and seeing it on the other side, you're sort of like, obviously it's it's painful for you as a writer when you get a rejection, but I think that it's it's quite grounding to see it from the other side and having to be the one yeah. to to give that critique but also to say no sometimes yeah I was like thank goodness I didn't have to go through every single one that the fiction editors and poetry <laughs> editors have to go to but uh, our launch party's in two weeks and it's at the that's gin exciting. distillery like it's so gonna be so oh that's good. lovely <laughs> the oldest gin distillery in the country I think in England is really awesome. oh really so mm. it was we, we did a tour there for my birthday it was great lovely oh I have to um, make note of that <laughs> I know it's gonna be a great party um so um um, going on still on your writing, mm-hmm. what would you say to a first time writer who's never published anything before or is nervous about getting their work out there? 
Yeah. Um, I guess in terms of um, they're thinking about submitting to something, but they're just nervous about rejection. Yeah. I guess yeah. So. yeah. I'm just trying to think. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think fair enough. I, we, you know, we've all been there and I think it's important to remember that the people who are on the other side have also been there. Like people get rejected for things all the time. And um, I think, you know, there, I don't want to be like, get a thick skin, but I think that rejection can be really useful for you to grow as a writer and as a person. And also sometimes it's, and actually most of the time, it's not about you or your work. It's about numbers of pieces that can be allowed in a submission or, you know, like so, so much of the time it's logistics on the editor's end, or it's just a subjective preference where, um, they it just isn't the right fit at this particular time for this particular person and I think I really wish that someone had told me that when I was like 16 and um sending all of these manuscripts out to agents and obviously getting nowhere because I didn't understand how the industry worked and I think it can seem very much like this um intimidating gatekeeper is there telling you whether your work is good or not and therefore whether you're good or not and and that's very much not the case it's um you know people are trying to do a good job with their creative work on both ends and so I think just yeah just just realizing that they're just people and that rejection isn't personal and that if you can if you have the opportunity for feedback that's great and if you can take something from that you know not all feedback is useful but if you can find something of use in that that is useful critique going forward then that's that's not really a rejection. That's kind of the best possible situation because that's just like having someone edit your work. That's just progress. Um, but don't be afraid to just put yourself out there because I think getting started is the hardest thing. But once you get into a flow and you kind of find your voice with writing submission letters and things like that and kind of figuring out what competitions there are and what places there are to send things out to um you kind of get the ball rolling and then you you kind of get confidence just by putting stuff out there I think just putting it out there is the hardest thing yeah I think it always is isn't it (laughs) yeah 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 I mean I was talking to obviously uh in the podcast I was talking to a literary Mm -hmm. agent and it was Mm -hmm. quite interesting to see how from their perspective how how they sort of sift through submissions which is really interesting it was fascinating yeah yeah Um, yeah yeah. I really admire literary agents they have uh, you know such fascinating jobs and also again such a multifaceted role I feel like um yeah every time I talk to agents I'm like wow you 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 know what you're doing (laughs) yeah yeah exactly all right, so finally, I think you've probably heard this question. I have asked a few people now, and this is always one that either people love or people loathe. Ooh. <laughs> what book have you read recently that you'd recommend? Or books or whatever? Ooh. <laughs> it could be anything. That is so difficult. Um, I will... I'll, I'll pick... Mm, how many should I pick? How many do you want? Well, however, <laughs> You're asking a bookseller, many, this is tricky. However many you want to talk about. Like, if there's a book you can go, I really like this book, I need to talk about it. Sure. Go for um, it. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Well, I'll, t- I'll talk about three that are sort of thematically linked. And um, yeah, so the first one is uh, The Doll Factory by Elizabeth McNeil, um, who is wonderful. And we're, we're actually doing a launch for her um, in Edinburgh and she's fantastic. So um, it's, it's kind of a very, um, a bit of a, one of those genre transcending novels. Uh, it's kind of hard to put in a box but um so it's kind of a Victorian so it's set during the great exhibition in Victorian London so I think it's 1850 something um and it follows these different characters so one of them is a taxidermist and he's a little bit creepy and um he's very obsessed with his kind of taxidermy which is definitely not a red flag for anybody um and the other character is a woman who she's from a kind of working class background but she kind of falls in with the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood um and becomes an artist model and then becomes an artist and it's kind of her her struggle with her identity and with kind of you know different class um yeah, clashes between class and gender, obviously being a woman at the time and being an artist was not, um, and obviously artists weren't considered, um, you know, reputable in some way. So I think that there's a lot of different social stuff going on there and the Great 
the great exhibition people were coming from all over the world to London so it's really really well researched and there's kind of like a very gothic um, tone to it and there's kind of like a, a mystery to it there's, there's a lot going on and I don't yeah. want to spoil Love anything a good but... gothic novel. oh that yeah you'll, you'll kind of see in this list that's a bit of my like, <laughs> my mo um Another one I read recently, which I loved, was um, Wakenhurst by Michelle Paver, who is a fantastic author, and she's she's done sort of children's books and, and adult books as well. And I think it's always great when authors can do both, because I feel like they're such different writing styles. Um, but yeah, Wakenhurst is, is, I think it's set in like the 30s in East Anglia and the marshes, and it's this very kind of atmospheric, brooding... Um, yeah (laughs) estate and it's about this girl and it kind of goes between the present and the past it's about her growing up with her dad who's this like historical researcher he gets obsessed with like medieval nuns and demons and 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 gets quite um yeah he, he he gets quite bizarrely obsessed with it and it's it doesn't go well for anybody um so again, I can't talk about much about these books because they're, they're all very like gothic mysteries and that's kind of the joy of them. I've got the theme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of my thing. Um, yeah, those are just a couple of things that I've been reading recently um, that really stick in the brain. Yeah, definitely. definitely. <laughs> so, I love a good gothic because I did a gothic module last year. It was so oh, amazing. good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love Anne Radcliffe now. I've never read any of her ah. books before. It's so good. Italian, I was like... What's going to happen next? <laughs> so yeah, I, I recently read um, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier and was so oh. shocked that I hadn't read it before now. And and some Shirley Jackson, We Have Always Lived in the Castle. And I just, yeah, I'm, I'm on a bit of a sort of female gothic kick. I think it's because I've started doing reviews for Sublime Horror. I was like, oh, I need to read more more gothic stuff yeah, so yeah I yeah think you always do the staple but then you've got like um mon my lecturers who specialize in eliza parsons and she wrote oh, a lot okay. of gothic, um, mm. gothic stuff and she's quite an undiscovered <laughs> author she's only just sort right. of been in the last ah, couple of years yeah, yeah yeah she was an amazing person Sweet. Really cool. Yeah, I mean, I do read some non-Gothic. I, I finished um, On the Come Up by Angie Thomas recently because she was up in Edinburgh a couple of months ago and that's very, very, very different, um, but fantastic. Um, yeah, don't, have you read any Angie Thomas? She's fabulous. Mm. <laughs> if you asked me how many books I've read so far, I've got my TBR is massive. Yeah, it's probably going to yeah. be... Yeah, I probably will read at some point, but I haven't read any books so far. Um, I'm currently... I'm obviously with today i have been sat in bed <laughs> reading um the flat share by beth o'leary i absolutely oh, love it it's so i keep good. seeing this everywhere on twitter and i'm like mm, i need this <laughs> i know i know I this is the trouble like, with uh, get, publishing I get twitter <laughs> I, get I know it's so good i'm like oh, it's just so whistly written the, the chapters mm. are really short so you get through them quite fast and i'm like oh, that's i don't nice. want this book to end already yeah oh yeah yeah yeah. That's such a good feeling, though, when you, you pick up something and you're like, I literally can't put this down, not even for a second. I need to know what happens now. So. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> she just got into the Sunday Times bestseller list and she, oh, I can't remember, she's like, so far. So like, oh, one day. One day. Yeah. This I know. It's aspirational. <laughs> it's fun to look up to. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. This has been so much fun. And thank you again for inviting me to come and chat with you. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Um... And hopefully I'll speak to you again soon. Thank yeah, you. looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for this week's episode. Thanks for listening. You can follow Catalina on Twitter at Catalina Watt. If you'd like to get involved with the podcast, you can get in touch through Twitter at NovelM16 and use the hashtag Slothcast. Or you can send me an email at slumberysloughbooknook at gmail.com. You can always find the podcast on our YouTube channel, slumberysloughbooknook, or you can download it from our Podbean for an on-the-go experience. See you next week. Bye.